So let's now turn to the Word of God. Please turn back to Psalm 34, and we are going to consider the truths that God has set before us there for a while this morning. Psalm 34, a psalm of David. You'll see that the introduction to the psalm tells us the circumstance in which David was moved by the Spirit of God to write this psalm. It says here, when he feigned madness before Abimelech, who drove him away and he departed. One of the trickiest passages, really, you're not quite sure what's going on if you're familiar with this. In 1 Samuel 21, David who has been anointed by God's prophet as king, is a fugitive. He's a fugitive from Saul. Though he was Israel's most successful general, yet Saul saw him as a threat to the future of his dynasty and drove him away and tried to kill him. And David is on the run. And David gets into a most desperate situation where he goes to the king of uh, of Gath and the Philistines are called Achish. And Achish is told, isn't this David, one of Israel's top men? What's he doing here? Is he spying on us? And so David, in a desperate resort, pretends that he's a madman and starts scratching on the, perhaps he was carving his name in the wood or something. And and dribbling down his beard, which is never an endearing thing, is it, really? (laughs) And yet, this man who has been marked out by God for such greatness and glory is brought to such a circumstance. And it says he's called Abimelech because that was the title of the king rather than the name of the king. So there's no discrepancy between the two parts of Scripture here. And in the end, David made his escape because he thought what was going to be a refuge turned out to be a rather dangerous situation that he'd put himself into. And following that, he wrote this psalm, which begins in the strangest of ways. Having been in that situation, he says, I will bless the Lord at all times. Now, you may not have said that immediately, having been in that situation, But look at what David does. And David recognizes that even there, the Lord was with him and blessed him and delivered him. And that ought to teach us something really important about living the Christian life. You see, David might be thinking, well, one day, because God has promised this, I'm going to be king. And one day, when Saul's out of the way, and all my troubles are over, and I'm king over Israel, then I will really give myself to serving him and praising him. And we can think like that too. I'm in a difficult place at the moment. I have a lot of concerns and anxieties and worries, and there are troubles and things that aren't right. And I want them sorted out. And when they're sorted out, then I'll really serve the Lord. And the Lord says, no, you serve me now. In that problem, I want you to glorify me. In that illness, in that financial problem, in that employment worry, in that neighborhood difficulty, in that family trial, I want you to glorify me in that because in weakness, my strength is made clear. And I bless you at that time. And God does that often. He brings us into a difficult situation where we feel most keenly our weakness. And then he blesses us. And we realize that our strength is made perfect in weakness. God's strength in our life is made perfect in weakness. We always want to be strong. We always want to be in control. We always want to be in the driving seat. And God says, no, you do not drive. You rely on me. And so God often blesses us best in weakness. And that's deliberate. That's no accident. So stop fighting against it. 
If you want to work on that more, then look at 2 Corinthians, where Paul explains this at great detail. That's the whole principle driving it through. He learned that in his life, and the sooner we learn it, the sooner we will understand what God is doing. So David begins this psalm, and he says, well, the first thing he says in verses 1 to 3 is that Christians should praise the Lord at all times. So if you're taking notes and you're wondering what the first point is, that's the first point. Christians should praise the Lord at all times. He says in verse 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. That's my default position. When I boot up in the morning, when I start functioning, I praise the Lord. Whatever my situation I am looking to praise God. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Now we've got David's example here. David wrote it in difficulty. So we're not looking at something and I'm blandly saying to you, don't worry, just be tranquil and praise the Lord. No, we are recognizing the reality of our difficult situations and we're still saying that we glorify God when we glorify him in our difficulties, recognizing our difficulties, we still praise him. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. We should boast in God. That should be something we are pleased to tell others about, not the bargain we bought because it was reduced and it was so cheap and I got it at a really good price for what it was, a great deal. No, we boast in the Lord. This is the thing that excites us. This is the thing that we have to tell others about. And we will tell others. The humble, and we may want to put the word afflicted in there. They've been brought low. And David's thinking of himself and he's saying, others in similar situations will draw encouragement from the fact that they see me praising the Lord and I have something to say about it. And they recognizing the trials I've been through and praising God will say, well, if they can do it, I can do it too. There is a fellowship in rejoicing in God in difficulties that can encourage one another in the fellowship of God's people. As you live together as Christians through the years, You see folk go up and down in their circumstances and you see that they went through that time and they had difficulties and they came out of it rejoicing in God. You're going to be be reading through Job very soon. There's a great example too. And here as well. The humble will hear and rejoice. And so then he says... And there's a church element to this as well. Look at the people of God gathering together. The one who has praise for God wants to do it in the fellowship of the people of God. Verse 3, O magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. We are designed to be constructed as a people. We're not designed to be individuals who just happen to come to the same building at the same time uh, at various times of the week. God has designed us, if we are Christians, to fit in with other bits. The piece of the jigsaw is meant to fit with other pieces, and a Christian is meant to be a part of the body. You are not meant to be a floating arm or a floating leg. You join together and are made complete as you worship God together. So is this you? Are you the sort of person who is seeking to praise God? It's easy in a day when we think that standards are slipping, that the the, uh, influence of the faith is declining to say, oh, it's all going wrong, it's all going bad, it's worse than it used to be in our Father's Day. We say that sort of thing in the UK and we are worse than you are. We shouldn't be like that. We should be saying, well, there are real challenges for us today. But we're going to praise the Lord anyway. We're going to rejoice in our God. Because it's great to complain, but it does discourage. And we ought to rejoice and say, how good is our God? And actually build one another up, rather than sit around together and agree about how dreadful the state of the world is. Because it is. 
but also we've got the answer. So, section 2, verses 4 to 7, give your testimony. Now, what I mean by that is every true Christian can give an account of how God is and has worked in their life. They can say something about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he means to them. They can say something about how God has kept them and dealt with them and provided for them and helped them through the years. And this is what David is saying here. I sought the Lord, verse 4, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Verse 6, this poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Here's David saying, look what God has done for me. Look at his mercy. Look at his grace. Look at the difficulty I was in. He could have gone away from Achish and thought, I never want to think about that again. I'll put that behind me. That, I was in a really bad place there. And the best I can do is blot that out. And he says, no, because God was working in my life there. And perhaps there are other Christians who can be encouraged by that too. I've got something to say about God and we've got something to say about God, and we can encourage one another as we share with one another God's dealings with us. And then he says, verse 5, they looked to him and were radiant, and their faces will never be ashamed. If you put your expectation in God, he does not let you down. A person may promise to do something, and they may mean to do it, and they may let you down. And they may let you down in a very big way. But God does not do that. You can look to God and you can look to God and you can look to God. And every time he works and he delivers. Why? Because of verse 7. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. This is not a coincidence. This is part of being a Christian. A godly Christian, a powerful Christian, a gifted Christian, and a weak, struggling, uncertain Christian too. God encamps around you. He watches over you. He keeps you. He rescues. From, the, from life we learn to trust God and to share this fact with others. You see, the Bible is realistic about life. It recognizes the joys of living for God. It recognizes the trials and difficulties we face. And the Lord's blessing can deal with it all. It's an interesting thing visiting this country. You go to every checkout and they want to know how you're doing. They're very concerned, aren't they, for your welfare. <laughs> how are you today? How are you doing? And you're supposed to say something like, I'm good. That's what you're supposed to say, mind. You're not supposed to say, well, I've just been to the hospital and I had this terrible news. They don't want to know that. They want your money, don't they? Quick, move through. They're not really concerned for you. They say the right words. Or you could go to some club that you belong to or society or something or a class. And they, they do. They're nice people. And you spend time with them and they are concerned. But... After a certain point, they don't want, really want to hear about your troubles, do they? No. But you see, as a Christian, the Lord encamps around you and will keep you in every situation. The tacky, difficult, concerning bits as well as the joyful, happy, upbeat things. God deals with the downbeat as well as the upbeat in life. And we can trust him for that. So, verses 8 to 10, David now says, will be a witness. How do you explain to other people the Christian faith? Somebody says, you're a Christian, aren't you? You take this seriously. You say, oh yes, there's a lot of serious truth here now. And you've got to understand all these things. David doesn't begin there. He says in verse 8, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, of course, in the Christian faith, there is a lot of truth people need to understand. And a lot of them start in completely the wrong place in thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ. But how are you going to explain the faith to them? 
If you're the sort of Christian who is ready to praise God, then you're in a position to say, well, taste and see that the Lord is good. Even Costco have worked that out. You go around there, and there are these people with these little samples they want you to eat. And you say, oh, it's lovely. I'll have lots of that, thank you. And they say, another, another sale. But you see, the gospel has a reality and a power that enters people's lives because the Lord is good, and the Lord blesses. And he's not meant to be a presence that weighs you down and makes you so grave and so serious that nobody wants to come near you because you're so holy. That's the wrong sense of holiness. Holiness has a purity and an honesty and an integrity and a a rigor and a life and a joy about it that people are both repelled from and attracted to at the same time. And David is saying, how blessed is the man who takes refuge in him? Now that is the message. That's what you want to share with people. And you can say it to your brothers and sisters in verse 9. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. For those who fear him, there is no want, no lacking, no shortage. God will Provide. That's one of his names, isn't it? Persevere, Christian, and trust him for everything. But if you're the sort of person who thinks, well, I'm doing okay, thank you. I don't really need this God in my life. You look at verse 10. Even the young lions, the young lions. Now, they're the ones, surely, aren't they, who are going to go out and hunt. They've got the power. They've got the strength. They've got the appetite. They've got the energy. They are going to lack and suffer hunger. Now, of course, you don't observe a lot of lions around Modesto. But you do observe a lot of people who think they can do very nicely, thank you very much, without Jesus Christ in their life. Why would I want that? Why would I want him? Why would I want this? There's lots of other things to be excited about. Yes, and when... The chips are down and difficulties arise and troubles come. Where do the young lions look? They starve to death. And you might think you're doing okay now. But the time will come when you are not. You aren't immune. And you will need help and strength and support. And if you've been wise, you will have found that in the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't think you don't need God. Life will bring you low if it hasn't already. And the Christian can say, yes, and the Lord lifted me up. So learn to be wise, verses 11 to 14. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Common sense, I I understand that you know what I mean by common sense. We think that common sense in the UK isn't as common anymore. I don't know what you think over here. You know, the sensible approach to life, where you look at things in a measured, balanced way and work things through. People seem to live pretty chaotic lives increasingly. And you think, if only they were more ordered in their approach, more organized in things. They had a coherent outlook on life. Yet they seem to get themselves into such a mess. Their finances, their relationships, they're just about everything. They don't even seem to care for themselves. It's a feature of those who do not know who they are and the world in which they live. And so... They don't have any fear of the Lord. They don't begin with God. They don't start from a position of recognizing who they really are as human beings and what they're doing in this world that is God's world. And yet David says, well, now look. Wisdom is to fear the Lord. If you are smart, you begin with God. You get so many things that are smart nowadays. Smart TVs, smartphones, and then... They don't work and they're dumb. And people are the same. If you are smart, you begin with God. The wisest life 
is the one where God is central. The wisest life works itself out in this way. Verse 12, who is the man who desires life and loves length of days that he may see good? This is the one who puts God first. There was a saying, there's some company, I think, you have one life, live it. Well, that doesn't get you very far because unless you're suicidal, you're going to be doing that anyway, aren't you? But what the Bible says is you have one life, love it. Care for your life. Realize where your best good lies, and that is with the Lord Jesus Christ. Nowhere else. Everything else will harm you, as we'll see in a moment. But this way, this is the way of life. So keep your tongue from evil, because how easy it is for us to say something and not be able to take it back. How easy it is for us to hurt people with words. And they do have power, and they do have effect. And we say things, and we wished we hadn't. And we say things about people to other people. And we lie and we deceive and we damage. Yes, tongues do evil. Lips speaking deceit destroy human relationships. And they are an offense to God. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. These are the things that are a wise life. That's the way we should be doing it. Consider our words. <laughs> Consider our acts. Consider our aims. Learn to be wise. There is a wisdom in living the life that puts God first, because that's how the world really is. But also, you see, we should rest secure in the Lord. Verses 15 to 18. The Christian life isn't always about running about and doing things. The Christian life is service flowing from understanding where we really are. So grasp this if you're a Christian this morning. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous. And if you're a Christian, you can say, me. The eyes of the Lord this morning are toward me. Whoever you are, however long or short you've been a Christian, however much you know or don't know, the eyes of the Lord are toward you this morning. Not to watch to catch you out. This is to care for you. Like a parent is always watching their little child. The little child doesn't always know it. But the parent is watching them because they're concerned for them. To save them from harm. To save them from falling into difficulty. To save them from falling into a, a situation where they injure themselves. His ears are open to their cry. You hear, don't you? You hear very quickly when the child cries. There's a certain quality about a little child's voice. We were hearing it yesterday as we were out. It wasn't in a particularly pleasant note, but it doesn't half penetrate. But God doesn't need to be alerted and reminded the moment we cry, he knows. In fact, we're told he knows before we cry. But for the Christian to cry to a heavenly father for help in a time of difficulty delights the heart of God. And he delights to answer. If a parent, a human parent, can delight to help a child who's struggling and asks for help, then surely we can believe our Heavenly Father, who is the perfection of all parenthood, of all fatherhood, is the one who watches over us. The righteous cry, verse 17, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. You can rest in Him in every situation. You are never outside the sphere of the care and the power of God. And it's not like us where we'd want to help, but we can't somehow. We don't have the means in, in whatever way is needed. God has the ability and the willingness. Like the leper who came to Jesus and he said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus said, I'm willing. And in your life, God says, I am willing and I will do it. I will keep you. I will watch over you in every situation. 
God specially cares for his people. He helps, he hears, he acts in all troubles. But look at the other side of this verse, these verses here, 15 to 18. The face of the Lord, verse 16, is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth. That's a terrible thing. The eyes are on the righteous. The ears are towards them. The whole face is turned away from those who will not seek him, who will not follow his way, who choose their own path, the evildoers. And yet the Lord is near, verse 18, to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Do you see how David, and therefore how God, for God was inspiring him here, is speaking to us about the difficulties of life that we have? They are recognized. They are owned as being part of this life. And as mature Christians, you can tell this to those who are young in the faith. And those who are young in the faith, you tell it to mature Christians because they will be so encouraged to hear it from you as well. Rest secure in the the Lord in this life because you see verses 19 to 22, it's only Christians who live in the real world. Look at what it says in verse 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. And how many advertisements do you see? And they say, now this car, this house, this whatever it might be, will change your life, will give you the comfort that you desire, will give you the tranquility you're looking for. Just about everything now is sold, not on the fact that it's faster, stronger, more durable, but the fact it will change the way you live your life. We got to the stage in the UK where... Do you know what I mean by gravy? Even if you buy that, that thing that will make the sauce that goes on your food will change your life. Because that's really what you're looking for, isn't it? A life that is transformed. A life that will be right in every circumstance. But that's what God is talking about here. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. People don't want to hear about trials and difficulties They want positive, don't they? Well, this is positive. We are positive there will be trials, and we are positive that God will be with us in them. So if you're trying to construct a life where there are no trials, where there are no fears, where there is no problem, and you say, this Christian life is difficult. I don't like this. The idea of the Lord owning my life and directing everything that I do. I want to be free of that. Well, you will be able to be free of that because the Lord will turn his face away from you. But what about when the afflictions come? Oh, that's okay. I've got plenty of other things to do. I've got my tablet. Not the one you take. The one you look at all the time. Look at all the entertainment that's around. How much of it has to do with really addressing the issues of the real world? There's been a lot of fantasy developing in, in stories that are now on films and in the, on the TV. Lord of the Rings was very popular. Star Wars was very popular. The Hobbit. Avengers. Um, who else am I thinking of? A whole raft of stories that don't exactly deal with real life, do they? Sorry to sort of surprise some of you about that. X-Men, you know, these ordinary characters that just face up to life in in a, a real way. People like Thor and Captain America. Are these the kind of individuals with which we can really relate? Do they really face ordinary life situations? Does Superman have a real problem with his knee as he gets older? These characters, they only specialize in saving the world... The world is threatened in so many different ways, isn't it? Whether it's from alien invasion or a fatal virus or a computer bug that will launch all the nuclear weapons in the world at one time or turn all the seas to to oil. or Who knows what it will be next? But they're always at that level, aren't they? That's the kind of entertainment that is being produced more and more. It verges into the realms of unreality. 
So you get everything that's spawned from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. You've got all sorts of werewolves and vampires all over the place nowadays. Even Jane Austen's characters in some books end up meeting with, uh, with zombies. You may not have seen those books. They're published in the UK. It's wacky. Now, I'm not saying that to dry, derive entertainment from some of those things is wrong in itself. But when your world is made up of these things, you're not living in the real world. And when you want a life that is free of God and is fulfilled and meaningful and purposeful, you are not living in the real world. And you want a life where you do not have illness and disease and grief and affliction and loss. You're not living in the real world. It's not how it is. Look at other people's lives. And you may say to yourself, well, I don't want a life like that. But you don't get the option. The Christian lives in the real world. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones. Now, let's not, let's not be too literal here. That does not mean to say that a Christian will never need the skills of an orthopedic surgeon. Your bones may literally get broken. But the point here is you will be rescued. You will be kept. You will be blessed. Remember David's situation again. That's where we are. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants. And none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. For ultimately, it is not only about this life. It is mainly about the world to come. The glory that is ours. The inheritance that God has given us. We will not be condemned, for Christ has redeemed us. We will not be lost, for Christ will keep us. And indeed, the circumstances of life that we are delivered through are a sure promise of the ultimate deliverance from judgment and condemnation. But not for everyone. Verse 21, evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. First of all, let's deal with a big principle here. There is a judgment for those who are not righteous. And you may think this morning, well, that's a hard thing to think about. It doesn't seem, this, this thing about the, the judgment on the last day, that doesn't seem very real, does it, just living in the ordinary world? But can I warn you, we are not very good at believing things we cannot actually see immediately. Learned that the other day. We went to San Francisco. There's about a 30 degree difference, isn't there, in temperature between here and San Francisco. How in a place like this, when you had temperatures about 103, 104 degrees, do you dress for San Francisco? So hot here. And then you get to San Francisco, it's so cold there. And you, and you know in your head the temperature is going to be different. But it is hard to actually prepare for that. Well, if we struggle with that, how hard is it really to recognize in our lives heaven and hell and judgment? We need to go by the facts we've got before us in the Word of God. And the weather report will tell you but sometimes our experience fails to catch up with it, doesn't it? Sometimes it's hard to do that. Or now, you see, at the church where we worship in the UK, they'll be in the middle of their evening service. They're eight hours ahead of us, so this is their evening service. And we've got a son and daughter-in-law in Singapore, and they should be asleep by now in the early hours of the morning. That's hard to think about, isn't it? We aren't very good at thinking outside this immediate situation we're in. But when we've got a reliable source of information telling us this is so, we just have to bring our instincts into alignment with it, don't we? And it says here, evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. Just two points to note from that as we draw to a close. What slays the wicked? Their own choices bring the judgment of God upon them. It's what they think will bring them freedom that is actually evil that will bring them down. They think they're going to be free. 
And it condemns them to ruination. And one of the tests that you can really apply is this. Those who hate the righteous will be condemned. Those who give you a hard time as Christians. This isn't something for you to triumph in and rejoice in. It's a solemn reality for you to recognize. Those who treat Christians badly, God is going to treat badly. Because God delights in his people, and he does not delight in people who do not delight in you. Do not give Christians a hard time. And remember to pray for those who do, because they are facing a terrible consequence. But the Lord is going to redeem us. The Lord is a shelter and blessing in this life and all eternity for the people of God. You may say, but well, where's the Lord Jesus in all of this psalm? This is the Old Testament, but we're in the New Testament. Where's the Lord Jesus in all of this? Well, I would say to you, everywhere. Because if you just look at one or two pointers, in verse 4, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. That is the hallmark of a God of redemption, that he delivers. Earthly deliverances are an evidence of our eternal deliverance. God is a God who delivers, and he delivers through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, because every blessing in this life we have flows from the redemption that we have in Jesus Christ. And then in verse 7, who is it that camps around those who fear him? Some like these people who, who delve into angels and voices and so on, spirits. No, it's not some odd occasional angelic being. This is the angel of the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God who cares for his people, directs his angelic servants, but he himself defends us and keeps us and watches over us. He does all of this because he has offered himself once for all. Verse 20, as we come to the Lord's table, look at verse 20. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. At one level, that is the, an expression of God's care for his people in protecting them. But at another level, of course, as soon as you start hearing bones not broken, you know very well we're talking about the offering of the Lamb of God we were hearing about last week as a perfect offering for sin. No bones broken, perfectly offered, no blemish, no defect, and no broken bones because that was the offering that God would accept, and that is the offering God has accepted in the Lord Jesus Christ. John's Gospel tells us that. And so, in verse 22, the Lord redeems the soul of his servants. There's a sacrifice to redeem us. There is a price that has been paid. The Lord Jesus Christ has paid that price. He paid that price for David, just as he's paid it for us. And every believer and everyone who is saved is saved through the blood of Christ and the offering of Christ. You see, this whole psalm is about God's deliverance of his people. But it is based upon the fact that we are delivered from affliction and sin because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was delivered over to affliction and God's judgment on sin at Calvary. We are delivered because Jesus Christ was not delivered. He went to the cross and he endured for us everything that that salvation is designed to deliver us from. Isn't that a glorious thing that God has done? Shouldn't we praise him for it? Which takes us back to verses 1 to 3. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth because we know what a great salvation we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us praise him for it and let us praise him as we come to the Lord's table now. Amen.